Welcome to Shardcast, the Brandon Sanderson podcast. We're a bunch of mega fans giving you the news discussion and, of course, a whole lot of opinions about Brandon's works in the Cosmere. I'm Eric, and joining me is Ian. Hey, I'm Weird Rider. Also joining me is Jesse. Hello, I'm Lady Lameness. Also joining us is Ian. Hi, I'm Ian. Hey, so we are talking about Defiant, the fourth Skyward book. And it's pretty good. As it happens. It is. We have, it is. I have a slug. Hello? Uh, th this is part supposed to be green, but it's fading into the ether. But, you know, that's fine. The slug is generating illusions. Yes. <laughs> illusions. <laughs> <laughs> so, the fight came out. Let's talk about our spoiler-free reactions. Ian, why don't you start us up? I'm going to start with, as with the rest of the books, I really like this book. It's the best book. But also, most importantly, the Civil War is over. The Civil War in the Skyward fandom is it, over. As both yeah. sides agree. That's true. Yeah. That is a true statement. I have seen people who don't like Defiance, but those people seem to also just like not like Spencer in general. So oh, what yeah, can you're you do? Them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you get to a point where if you don't like the main character of a series and like actively don't like them, it's probably not the series for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesse, spoiler free thoughts. This book was great. Uh, this book makes the series great again. Uh, <laughs> the series is much easier to sell now that this book is out. Everyone should read this book. Ian, what you think? Yeah, I'm I'm not going to break the chain of people who just love it. I I love this book. Um it is possibly my favorite one in the Skyward series. I think it has a lot of I think a lot of the things Brandon has been doing well lately are showcased well in this book. Um and it has like some flaws, but my overall experience reading the book was always just like almost always I'm just having a blast. I think having reread skyward for span reads this one is definitely either my favorite or tied for favorite now just because i think skyward has take, taken a step down in my mind whereas defiant was just everything i wanted it to be so yeah i would put it up there as like probably my favorite skyward book as well Ooh, favorite skyward book I like this this book is very good i've reread it a bunch uh at this stage and i've loved it every time i've reread it even more it really brings the series together we finally i feel like have kind of a proper sequel to skyward because it has a lot of the elements from the first skyward book that i thought were kind of missing in the first two books but it also brings uh star sight and cytonic things really together so it's a really good melding and like really makes the series work and feel actually like kind of cohesive, which is a ni that's nice because I didn't think I didn't think it was possible and how, how foolish of me. But, mm -hmm. you know, Lost yeah. Metal was a, you know, a little, little hit and miss. And so it's <laughs> nice to have yeah. a, a solid hit there. There's some quibbles, I think. But I think this is solidly really good. I don't have a rant here we'll see i might have a rant but like i, I don't have a big rant like mm -hmm. delvers or uh cytonic stuff here i think i think it is solid here and i'm impressed it just it brought everything together it had tension and yeah great ending i think mm -hmm. yeah reading the series again after reading defiant i think makes every book stronger but particularly starsight and cytonic i see the purpose of both of those books now and the necessity of them for this book to um work and to exist but i also think like a first time read through is going to go a lot better now because you can go just straight through and straight into defiant instead of having that stopping point at the end of cytonic where people are really split at that point of whether they're happy or not happy with the series and just have something 
that does just pull everything together again. So the this series is a lot stronger now that it's finished, whereas Era 2, Lost Metal didn't do that. Like it didn't make the series as a whole better. Or it didn't make the other books better. True. Yeah. yeah. I'd say that's a true statement. It didn't stick the landing. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. very much stuck the landing. This very mm-hmm. much stuck the landing. <laughs> and set up for future stunts. Yes. Yeah. So should we get on to spoilers? Who wants to start with spoiler reactions? Uh, moving into some spoiler spoilery reactions, aside from just general adoration for this book, uh, I really liked the handling of the characters and their relationships to each other. And obviously, the biggest example with that is going to be Spensa and Jordan, uh, who are just, I think, one of the best examples of a romantic relationship in Brandon's works these days mm-hmm. for a few different reasons. I, I love how like we get the date scene which was super cute mm-hmm. uh that was so cute and it was. like i love how there was some flirting and they're like is this too fast it's like i'd actually just like really like a massage it's like that's relatable honestly they they seem like they're under a lot of stress so that makes a lot of sense but then also spensa doing the mission behind uh jorgen's back and then just Jorgen just being so furious. It's like, oh, brutal stabs. Mm-hmm. And then Spencer being kidnapped. And then she just thinks Jorgen's going to think I just ran off again. That's like, ah. But he doesn't. <laughs> but he doesn't. Oh. I love that. Like everyone else in the coalition is like, nah, man. She just ran off. Like that. that's who she is. And he just has it in his heart. He's like, no, she promised me she wouldn't do this yep. again. Mm-hmm. And I trust her to that extent that I know that she didn't do this. And she was right. Totally yeah. right. Like, um, I love yes. that. Yeah, I liked that whole relationship because Brandon allows it to get messy. Because mm. sometimes his romances, it's, it's all just, it works out too well. Yeah, like, saccharine. It, everything just goes fine. Like there's no real struggles there. But the other thing that struck me as I was reading this is it's very reminiscent of a lend in Vin in Well of Ascension. It's like boy thrust into leadership he is overwhelmed True. by and feels unworthy of, and girl who thinks she's incredibly dangerous and a weapon. Yeah. <laughs> It's true. You know, there's just some themes that, you know, mm-hmm. they did. They just work. But as much as I do love Finn and Elend, it works so much better here. Hmm. Brandon's grown a lot in the over 50, yeah, like 15, 15 ish plus years doing this. So it's going, it's going pretty well. I also really loved uh there were a couple moments in the book where the two of them compromised for each other or is explicitly took steps to show each other that they loved each other like when she got back from a mission uh one of the first ones in the book jorgen specifically like went out of his way to kiss her in front of other people even mm. though he's all like by the book it's not great that uh that you're dating your superior officer kind of thing. But he specifically kisses her because he wants to give her that attention and he wants to give her a moment of love right then. And he knows that it will help her. And she specifically appreciates it, knowing that it goes against what like his preferred series of events um, and that he's doing it specifically for her. There were one or two moments like that in the book and I really liked those. I thought those were well done and then spencer makes an appointment with his secretary yes that that was that wasn't that was the other one i was trying to remember yes she's like i did it for you (laughs) i waited they're trying for each other i mean you you gotta have time in your uh, appointments to talk with other superior officers when things come up you know like it it Mm -hmm. makes sense it's interesting seeing it from spencer's point of view because she's going through so much ptsd at the time and pulling away from everybody and 
she is having those thoughts of I need to like cut this off or like I need to stay away from this and but as soon as she gets into one of those situations with Jorgen and has any scrap of love uh, directed towards her she just latches onto it because that's actually what she needs but her brain is telling her that it's the opposite of what she needs until she gets it and it's really interesting seeing those two things happening at once because i think a lot of people can probably relate to that in one form or another there's an interplay between her character arc and the relationships she's having which you don't always get uh especially with romantic relationships in brandon books uh and it's really nice to see that interplay yeah Going back to the um, Vin and Elon comparison, like both Vin and Spencer think that their partner is um, like that they're not good enough for their partner. True. And Brandon definitely does better with Spencer in showing that, well, Jorgen does think you're good enough. And she eventually Spencer does get to a point where she thinks she's good enough than he did in Well of Ascension. But again, the difference in 15 years of practice. Yeah. And it felt like realistic for these characters and like their ages. So it's like a good YA romance, I feel like as well. Mm -hmm. And just, and it is just really nice because I feel like in Star Sight, we just like, they kiss, she's gone gone until now and so like it's just really nice to see that brandon like did put in the time and it was an important part of this book mm -hmm. brandon really played on the whole absence makes the heart grow fonder in the series mm. because there's very little that we actually get between spencer and jorgen up till this book but yeah we get to this book and getting the relationship as it is feels like we've had the build up to it even though there's been so little there and he he's really done it quite well i think the cytonic interludes and also uh evershore by chancy both really go towards what you're saying there and with that i feel like brandon did a great job with spensa thinking like wow i've missed out on like so much just with everyone. Oh, quick shout out, by the way. Brandon actually, I think, did a really good job of summing up the novellas for people who didn't read them. I think so, yeah. Like, yeah. I didn't actually think it was possible <laughs> to, to like do it super well. And I think Spencer being like, wow, yeah, they, they sure did a lot. And I, I sure, I guess, <laughs> was a great way of doing that and getting it into her character. Yeah, I, I have read comments from people who didn't read the novellas and enjoy, like, didn't feel like they were missing anything when we. That's really talk. good. Yeah. Because yeah. that's, I think, what a lot of people who did read everything were a bit worried about of mm -hmm. like, what, what are people going to think if they didn't read the novellas? But if people are reading it and it's working, then it's doing its job. Yep. Mm -hmm. I liked how Brandon tied it in with the magic as well and how she was getting these glimpses of what happened in the same way that she got glimpses of the past in the nowhere. And she was only getting it because mm. of her connections to her friends. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really neat way of doing it. So it didn't just seem like, oh, someone told me this and now I'm going to info dump it in my head. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I really liked that. And I really liked just, kind of the stress of getting back into being on the flight as well. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, Kimmelin, best. Kimmelin's great. Uh, and Kimmelin, best girl. Canonically, has a girlfriend. Love that. Mm -hmm. uh, confirmed. But... Heck yeah. Yep. But Kimmelin, just like trying to get Spencer to open up, and it's just like challenging for Spencer. Like, she's just been through mm -hmm. a lot and then we finally get that scene bringing like Hesho in to wash the ships. And it's just such a nice mm -hmm. scene, both with like Hesho talking with Ned. Like there's so many character interplay things that it's like, ah, yes, this is what I've been missing. But it also 
worked really well because it's been a long time since we've been with those Skyward characters. Mm-hmm. Like it's kind, it's kind of interesting how that worked and how much I enjoyed that. And having it in first person, so we're getting it from Spencer's point of view, we're really getting the, well, this is what she thinks is happening, but that's not necessarily true. It's like Mm -hmm. the perceived reality versus the actual reality. And like, she's perceiving that, well, her friends have moved on. Like, there's this line about how the person that she pretended to be is yeah the person that she replaced in starside has now replaced her in skyward flight and like that reversal and that's all she's seeing is that they're over there and she's over here and she doesn't know how to bridge that gap but they're constantly trying to pull her back in and her brain's just struggling to actually take that in and to Mm -hmm. make that connection so when she finally does like those two realities come together yeah it's basically like she's like there's such a gap between me and skyward flight as she's running away from them and they're chasing her it's like (laughs) yes there's a gap because you're running away they're trying to catch up to you Ah, i can't deal with this stand still and let me catch you but also, mm-hmm. it was very interesting seeing like the the times where she makes reality warp around her, and it's actually Chet mm-hmm. getting mm-hmm. like all those emotions of that pain and things mm. that I, you know, just I really like that. Also, Jess, would you agree Hesho much better in this book than the last book? Okay, so I do have some thoughts on this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yes, I would agree Hesho is much better in this book than in Cytonic. Uh, I liked his character. Um, I, I liked his relationship with Spencer. I liked uh, when he was brought in to meet the flight. I find it really funny that Jorgen doesn't like him and thinks he's weird. I just find that hilarious. <laughs> But he ties into a problem I do have with the book that is not just Hesho, but it's kind of Hesho and Doomslug and Embot and Chat. <laughs> Spencer's collected all of these characters <laughs> that are just kind of around her for most of the book. And they sort of have character arcs or are doing things. But a lot of the time, they're kind of not. They're, they're just kind of waiting until they're needed at a different point in the plot. And the, the the character arcs that they're getting feel kind of flimsy to me. So, like, I liked the scene where Spencer is talking with Hesho and he's str- struggling with not being Emperor anymore. I really liked that scene. I don't really think that was like a whole character arc over the whole book. It, it is just, just like what scene. Kind of followed her around for the yeah. rest of it. So that that was something that did jump out as something I didn't particularly like in this book, but there wasn't much else that Brandon could do with these characters without like taking away from Spencer's journey. But he still needed them for like stuff at the end. Like he needed Embot and he needed Chet for the stuff with the Delvers. Mm-hmm. But they they don't do very much for most of the book. They're just like kind of there. And it, it is cool to find out that Chet is the one that's doing the warping, not Spencer. But yeah, he's just kind of there and giving like lines to her and, and like it, it is cool getting the interplay with them but i i would have liked if there was a little bit more happening with those characters and the fact that there's so many of them <laughs> i like think is why it's, them. yeah it, it like really stood out because of how many there were yeah it's like I has show like we we have the scene where we use has show so spencer can figure out all her stuff like yes she brings has show to the flight but in so doing, she returns herself to the flight and kind of resolves that mm-hmm. just in time for her to vanish off the face of the universe, because of course that needed to happen. But we don't actually resolve. We set up Hesho's arc and we don't resolve Hesho's that arc is true. in this book. True. It's like, yes, he's found belonging with Spencer and potentially with Squired Flight. That doesn't resolve, like, how is he going to interact with his people again? Like, his family, yeah. like, 
that's still important to him. Like that, just because he has new friends doesn't mean losing his family would hurt any less. Like that's not resolved at all. Yeah, that's true. I also find that like the, these characters around Spencer, like they're there, pri- like only really for Spencer. Like mm-hmm. they do, do have things happening in their lives, but it's so that they can be available for Spencer's plot to advance. And the one that stands out as the opposite to this is Rig and the conversation she has with Rig in the room with the platform that looks down at Detritus. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the same as a lot of these conversations she's having one-on-one with Hesher, with Chet, but Rig's got this whole other life that I can very much imagine outside of this conversation, he's going to leave and go do some engineering stuff. And like, he literally goes and builds a flagship in the background of this book. Mm -hmm. And like, he has a girlfriend that he's going to go have a life with. And I don't get that for these other characters. Like their only purpose is to push Spencer's story forward. So it would have been nice just to have like a little bit more of, their character existing in the world instead of their character existing for another character. I, I actually, I saw this most, I think, with Mbot and a little bit with Chet. Um, I didn't really notice it with Hesho, but now that you're saying it, I'm like, oh yeah, I can see the same problem. It did. It felt like Mbot just kind of popped in and said things occasionally and just was not having any kind of arc or relationship with Spencer other than occasionally showing up as a ghost and haunting her. And it also felt like for someone who was literally sharing her body, Chet didn't do or say all that much. Or like, it's like, okay, you keep mentioning comments about having a Delver in your soul. You have a guy who occasionally calls you and talks about stuff. And that's about all he's doing. And like also making things go crazy in the background. It felt kind of like, okay, but where where is the... Like the interplay between them, maybe. Yeah, I feel like we're we're using that word a lot. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, they just show up and say say things occasionally, and they aren't like. It doesn't feel like they exist in the world so much outside of their interactions with Spencer. Um, speaking of Mbot just showing up and saying things, uh, this is one of my complaints about the book: is Mbot reappearing? <laughs> Very unsatisfying. Like. <laughs> I obviously I want M wanted M bot back the way he came back, just like rolling up, like as if nothing happened, no catharsis for his sacrifice, like completely unearned. Like it just like, yeah, he's here now. Like what? Jess, I, 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 I know you have some feelings. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't fully like, I, I didn't like that very much either. I feel like you disliked it more than I did. It just felt like a little bit out of nowhere. And yeah, like, it I didn't, mean, literally. Yeah, literally. Um, <laughs> yeah, like it didn't feel earned because Spencer was meant to like go back and find him or save him. Mm-hmm. And like none of that happened, like none of that mattered he just True. like it's cool that he saved himself i guess but yeah he's he's just there he's a spoopy ghost and he's 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 in the book too but i will just say him manifesting his ship at the end i saw it coming still so cool i so love it. it was the best i i did kind of want a like a massive delver sized mbot but it was pretty good to manifest as as the ship and have Spencer fly in and bot one more time. I'm like, yeah, I do. Lo- I I love that. Though I can see what you mean of Mbot just be like, hey, I'm a ghost now. What's up? <laughs> like that. That's basically the vibe, right? Mm-hmm. Mbot was hilarious in this book. I, I love Mbot in this book, but I can see what you mean how that is not very satisfying to have him just appear. Yeah, like it's like the that beginning sequence like needed to be tweaked in my opinion. It's like yeah. th- th- his return needs to be earned narratively speaking. Yeah. You can't just like throw it in hey, when you up? feel like it. What's up guys? I think the other thing with Mbot that 
was a bit unsatisfying for me is I love that Spencer was rebuilding his ship. Mm -hmm. And I love that at the end, he rebuilt his own ship. Like, I like that he had that autonomy to do it himself. Like, he didn't Mm -hmm. need someone to build him a ship. But they only built him half a ship, and then that was it with that entire part of the plot. And it felt a little bit not finished to me. I I, I would have liked Mm -hmm. something to can either continue with that afterwards of oh we like made this ship and to someone else's ship or did something with it because they they built half a ship and then just left it there and that was it that scene did feel for me just kind of like something for them to do while they were talking and as kind of a callback to build working on the ship in sky in uh in skyward sure um and that, that felt like enough of a purpose for me, but I think that's totally fair to be like, okay, there's just a half-built ship. This feels quite literally unfinished. I thought it was going somewhere, and it didn't. Because I remember the first time reading this, I had already thought, had the thought of, oh, and Bob's going to manifest a new ship mm-hmm. because that's what Delvers do. They manifest some a body based on what they had before. And then I got to that scene of like, oh, maybe I'm... At that point, I second guess myself, like, oh, maybe like Spencer is going to build him a new body. That that's that would also work. And then that didn't happen. It, it, I it was pure this- red herring bait to just like, yeah, he's totally not going to manifest himself, right? Yeah, I could see this because Jorgen gives Spencer the mandate at the end of the book to go forth and explore strange new worlds that what that might be one of those ships. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been nice if there was just a mention of that mm-hmm. at the end. It's like, oh, yeah, that ship you were working on, finish it off and then, like, give it to Kimmelin or something. I feel like a lot of these is just, there's not space in the book for all these things. And so Brandon's mm-hmm. like, okay, we got to bring it together and we get a conversation with Hesho and that we, we like get two of them. And he's he's yeah. the, he's there in the book for sure. And admittedly it doesn't help that for half the book spence is captured and no one and she cannot talk with anyone so it's like yeah admittedly just the way it's designed there is very limited room for that right yeah to continue on like i feel bad about like continuing to um complain about this book that we're all like guys this book is so good everyone should read it going off of that just in terms of certain things feeling unfinished this is more a pet peeve of mine but i really dislike when plots are set up in one book to be finished or one series to be finished in another series and they're just kind of left open-ended it i don't like open-ended like strings like that and this book has quite a few of them in it. So even though we do finish off the story with the superiority, a lot of other things feel a little bit unfinished. So the whole book feels a bit unfinished to me. And I know we're going to get more Spencer, so we're going to learn more about how she's doing and stuff. But she literally only gets to the point of maybe I'm OK, guys. And then that's it. We don't get any more of her emotional journey after that. Like, there's no real catharsis of her, like, settling into, okay, I can be with my friends. This this is going to work. Like, I'm not going to really go back downhill. Like, maybe there's back and forth days, but things are getting better now. We just jump straight into um, everything with braid in the end and then the very end is oh we're gonna go off on adventures like we don't really touch back on how she's doing sure and then there's like all the little plots as well that have been set up across the series of like what's the go with old earth what's the go with the figments where's like what's the go with vapor embots origin story level, all of these yeah. things that uh, have been the, the portals being sealed the portals yeah. being sealed yeah and like uh, the the ancient Dover, <laughs> it's not even Dover-like mentioned for like entity. Yeah. So like all of these things are being sprinkled into the series that are clearly set up for uh, either a future Spencer, Kimmelin, and Co. stories, or what Jancy's doing in Skyward Legacy. But I don't like that personally. Like I just don't like when it's set up like that because it felt like these were promises for this series that we were going to get answers 
And just getting to this, the end of this book, because there was so many of them, it did feel like this book was a bit unfinished to me. I, I did keep thinking in the final battle, when is Old Earth going to show up? <laughs> like, I, like, first time I read it, it's like, where's Old Earth? You can't just go to the moon and be like, hey, wow, that's that's crazy, guys, right? And like, in the beginning of this book, kind of feels like a promise later so like that that's probably mm -hmm. the big one for yeah. me and yeah. i think mbot's origin of like just like some more hints like maybe i don't know mm -hmm. if i needed like a lot about that but like a bit more because a lot of this is spencer and mbot and we like kind of didn't get any more on mbot in that way for me i think like it's 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 in a weird position where if we had gotten a little less set up in this book or a little more set up in this book I think that would have been better than this in-between state where it like mentions things and sets things up and it's like old earth. What happens to old earth? We keep mentioning what happened uh, and then just not doing anything. We don't get any hints as to what happened, but we also did specifically set it up. And so that did also feel kind of frustrating to me as well, where it's like, okay, if this is going to be in a later series or book, mm -hmm. I feel like we either should have not built it up in this one or we should have given at least some level of like just reach something where we learn some new information as opposed to just like yeah guys we have no idea what's going <laughs> on it. here That's what yeah like like if instead of just giving spencer here's a list of dangerous planets we don't know what's going on there it was like hey we found this record buried deep of like of a clue to old earth mm. Mm. giving it like a direct key into not skyward legacy but for the future skyward cytoverse books brandon mentioned he wants to write i think that would have been slightly more satisfying because you're right there there are a number of mysteries that there are lanterns put on them in this book that don't get a resolution which is probably brandon going like i don't this is not the story of this book but i want to make sure people don't forget about them like we would forget about earth being missing like you didn't need to lampshade that we're not gonna forget uh, admittedly i do think it was a bit subtle and like i think it's like two lines in other things M maybe a little more about old earth having it be a little more explicit in people's mind sure but mm. I think it's the fact that we got it in the beginning mission. Like it would be one thing yeah. if like we had like a paragraph about it in like 75%. It's like, okay, that's not gonna, that's, that's not foreshadowing mm -hmm. for the yeah. end of the book. That's just like lore that we're getting here. Right. Yeah. Whereas yeah. at the start of the book, it really came across like this was happening this book. Yeah. A little yeah. bit. I do also have to say going to the moon and the earth not being there very emotional for me i don't know like i was i was very surprised to be like oh no this is so sad like the earth went away and it didn't take the moon with it like that's <laughs> they're meant to be together and i was just like how i if it was the humans that took the earth away and they didn't bring the moon i'm very mad at them i'm like <laughs> why that's also very bad for the earth like we there's a lot of systems that rely on the tides and the moon being yeah. there is very important for that well you know what's also important the, the sun. reason we have one but the sun is also pretty important for the earth <laughs> ecosystem you know, they're not having those it's kind of big deal. details details <laughs> we can find another sun to rotate around finding another rock that's the right size is going <laughs> to rotate at the right okay. time okay that's a bit harder. Okay. Okay. I was wondering also, about the moon. That one was our rock. Yeah. It was exactly. our rock. It's <laughs> the it's like that splash from the one when we got um pulled by asteroids a very long time ago. Yes. So it's got that one line where she's like, Why did they describe it with such poetry? It's just a hunk of rock. And I'm like, well, it kind of looks better from our vantage point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're there, it looks awful. Like <laughs> True. I want to talk about, wait, we have some nitpicks, you know, welcome to the show, mm -hmm. but I want to talk about some kick-ass moments that are some of my fave moments. 
Does that sound good? You're allowed yeah. to say Becca Nightshade. Yeah. Becca oh. Nightshade is yeah, number yeah. one. That, that, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. The <laughs> detritus <laughs> opening up the defiant blazed on the ship. Yes. And then we get the uh, the grand grand speech. I Amazing. I, I have up on my screen right now. <laughs> it's so good. It's so I good. I actually like went into the bedroom and Jess was reading, rereading Defiant in prep for this podcast. And like, I had a question. Jess was like, hold on. I'm like, okay. You have to wait because I have just gotten to Grand Grand's speech. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's, <laughs> that's very fair. I, definitely a highlight of the book on how it's like, it's it's what an older Spencer would be like. And it's just, oh, it's 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 so good character wise and things. Oh man, so good. And I do really like the reasoning behind her like captaining the Defiant as mm -hmm. well. And everyone is well aware she's a figurehead. She mm -hmm. is well aware she is a figurehead. She has no idea how to run a ship and she is very happy to delegate to other people. Mm -hmm. So it's so sad that she stays behind and dies with it. But like it's <sighs> I I have a lot of emotions and thoughts about um Becca Nightshade. Okay. Obviously, she's the best. I don't know if I can put them all into words at this moment. There are no words. She's amazing. But the symbolism of her being the last of the old Defiant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do get very emotional during this part. Um, but yeah, it's very symbolic she's the last of the old defiant like she is here with the new defiant uh, kind of leading the way and it's also her sacrifice is the turning of the battle yeah so it's like she brings not vengeance but like justification like she brings satisfaction to everyone who crash landed on detritus yeah she, and, she uh, died for a meaning although i yes. think i've heard we, we do got to talk about her death. And it's like, and she's just so extra and I love her. <laughs> like, she really is there's the older version of Spencer. I love it. She is. And there's the scene earlier on um, when the Alliance is kind of doubting Jorgen and co because Spencer went off rogue and kind of messed with things. Becca, like Grand Grand gives the speech to, back then of like no we will not abandon you True. like this is the story of the defiant people it's like if we can't define you we sure as hell are going to take you with us i love that that was a great speech yeah. too yeah and it's I, I i have to read her speech let's do because it because it's just let's so good it. it's so it's, it's so like, good actually gonna start a little bit before go for it um Another visual winked into existence, a shot of the Defiance Bridge as Braid accepted the communication. There, seated in a captain's chair, was an old woman wearing a crisp white uniform, milky white eyes, a small figure, yet somehow still strong. Grand Grand? She stood up, holding on to the armrests of the chair. Superiority forces, she said in a firm voice. I am Captain Rebecca Nightshade of the Starship Defiant. Eighty years ago, you drew my people into your war. You obliterated the ship we called home, stole our heritage, and tried to annihilate us. As the last living member of the original Defiance crew, I've been granted my rightful commission as commander of this new vessel. I am of Clan Motorscops, the people of the engines. You picked a fight with us that we did not want. But then you foolishly failed to exterminate us. And so we are back. I am back. <laughs> the blood of my ancestors demands that I seek vengeance upon you. This is your only warning. 
Return to us the captives you've taken. Turn away from your path of tyranny, or I will see each and every ship that raises arms against us burn to slag, and your ashes will be abandoned to drift in the eternal expanse of darkness, forever frozen, without home or memorial, lamented by your kin, never again to hear the voices or feel a touch of those you have loved. I swear by the stars, the saints, and the souls of a thousand warriors who have come before me, I will have your blood. <sighs> God is so like the defiant popping out. I'm like, hell yeah. But then Grand Grand speech. Oh, yes. It's 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 just so good. good. Like, I'm so ready for the final battle now. Like, oh, yeah, let's go. And Mm. it's like half the book. I love that. I I love books that do this. Yes. And speaking of her earlier speech, uh, I have a quick story of like when she's um, convincing everyone to keep going. I was rereading that. And at the same time, you're like, I'm going to put this quote onto the Defiant page and I'll put this quote onto the Defiant page <laughs> on the cover of mine. Which Defiant like, page, Jess? You. The original one. Because she's talking about their yeah. original yeah, yeah, yeah. journey. So I was just updating all the quotes <laughs> with new ones. But like kind of like speeding off of that because the the literal next page is the the artwork of the the Mm -hmm. new defiant and it's there's a little thing here that does not get mentioned in the text that i absolutely love which is the class of ship it's a ddf phoenix class and what Mm. do phoenixes do from the ashes yes that's true i did notice that they rise from the ashes and they go up in flames and it's like because and it's the symbolism of like the defiant fell and we had a new defiant well if it's done it once it can do it again they 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 can and then there's also like another tiny little thing of grand grand talking about how like it's not the same ship but it is the same ship about the defiant which then get echoes with Spencer and when Mbot manifests his new body, mm-hmm. where it's not the same body he had before. Like there are there are new differences. Like it's there's a console for Hesho, there's a, a little cubby for Doom Slug, but it's still the same ship. And I, better. I yeah. I, I love the parallels of like a ship doesn't have to be the same ship to be the same ship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And speaking of parallels, like we get the one of Braid and Grand Grand, where Braid's mm-hmm. so full of herself with, oh, I've read all the histories, I know how everything was done, so therefore I can win the battle. And Grand Grand is, I know all the stories, I know how everything was done, so therefore I know nothing about running a ship and I don't know how to win and I'm going to listen to my military experts now. And just like back to back, he's literally well. back to back. Mm-hmm. Uh, Braid then grand grand chapter. Yep, I so good. I noticed that, and especially on a reread, it's really good because you're like, oh, I know it's gonna happen. Braid's just gonna get destroyed. A scene that wasn't kind of in the climax of the battle, but a scene of grand grand that I liked was when she was sitting in the cockpit of Spence's ship. Yes, um, yes, just like stopping great. her from getting in. That whole conversation, I really liked that. It was a lot <laughs> quieter, subdued, but it was it was very nice. Sometimes I just get disoriented and I just find yeah. myself in places like, oh yeah, sure, grand grand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sure. I, I, I thought of one more thing. Yeah. Which is going back to symbolism about grand grand going down with the ship, which the captain always goes down with the ship. It, it had to be her. Like, she couldn't let it be anyone else but also she is the last of the old in a way like she is that last connection to the what came before but this kind of frees them open to forge a new path forward it's not her time anymore it's spence's time i do want to like mention because i know that several people uh have talked about kind of a logical problem with why did Grand Grand have to die? Yes. It's like, okay, we have to have someone in the ship uh, because it's the law. And people are like, yep. okay, but we're <laughs> resisting these laws. Why does Grand Grand, why is she even following them? Uh, to which 
I don't remember if it's like programmed into the ships they were using yeah. or not. It's, it's like, hard it coded. It would yeah, be, hard-coded. yeah, changing it in time would be hard, which I, I still think that it's like a fair complaint of like, why wouldn't they have changed this? But also they're doing a lot at once. And I also thought Grant, the effect of Grand Grand's death on Spencer was worth it because I'm a sucker for when characters lose someone and then just psychic freak out. It's pretty that's pretty that's good. a trope. Yeah. That's a good trope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so initially I really dislike Grand Grand's death specifically for that reason, because everyone else is getting out. Why does Grand Grand has to have to go down with the ship? But rereading it it makes more sense to me and I have done a 180 and I do like it a lot more now mm-hmm. because it, like it's explicitly mentioned that the ship cannot pilot itself and the ship does need to continue going in a certain direction. So the braid like attacks it at a certain place. Yeah. And I mm-hmm. think that that programming is coming directly from the ship yards and that mm. they didn't program that in. That was, mm-hmm. like you said, it's hard coded in by the shipyards that were already on Detritus because that's how the humans would have done it in the past. And yeah, they just don't have time to try and undermine this coding and change it so that the ship can pilot itself. And but yeah, I initially had so many issues with Grand Grand going down with the ship. Whereas rereading it now, I'm like, okay, no, it makes more sense. I I'm okay with this. I think there also was an element of symbolism, not just to Raid taking down the Defiant, which they mentioned as being uh, like she she'll think she's like she's aiming towards this. She thinks taking this down is the most important thing, uh, but also to it being Spencer's grandmother, uh, that letting her like be the face of it makes Braid even more want to go True. after them. True. Um, yeah. Um, which is a reason for it to be her. I also just love she's she's not a military genius, even though it says she is That's in like such an a weird line. I don't hear um, no but, evidence of that whatsoever. She is the, the justification for that line, I think, is that she is the one that figures out the plan. Yeah. Like she's not, and she submits it of like, hey, will this actually work? And the general's looking at it and realizing, yes, it will, but it means losing you. And, uh, and that, that whole sequence of, because it doesn't get spelled out exactly, you kind of have to put it two and two together which gets easier the longest longer that sequence goes like as Jorgen is putting it out and so knowing it's coming doesn't make it hurt any less but yeah. knowing that she is 100 percent sold like yeah. there is no doubt in her mind this is what needs to happen and like the fact that she gets a hug from like the last one of the last people to go it's like oh Oh, grand grand so good it is so good and it's written so well i can understand someone being like okay this is a little arbitrary though that like brandon's put in these arbitrary restrictions to make grand grand time so i can see someone saying it's a little contrived when they all have teleporters but, like, but sure but also like those arbitrary things like go back to the first book it's yeah like, yeah the ooh, AI had for those sure. same restrictions and yeah. couldn't pilot himself yeah i i don't have an issue with it i just mm-hmm. i know some people d- i think if brandon had maybe seeded that specifically a little bit more whether it's through mm-hmm. the other books or even in this book when the defiant first turns up and we get becca's uh pov I don't remember if it's mentioned in that. The first time it's mentioned that the ship can't pilot itself is literally when the ship is going down. So it's mentioned a little bit before, I think. Like, but okay. even before she had the plan, I, I think. Either way, I, to me, it was like how close it was to what yeah. was actually happening. Whereas if it had maybe come up a couple of times earlier than that, then it would have being different maybe if they'd been talking about the the shipyards at some point and it's like oh they have all of these rules and regulations that we can't break through i want to talk about braid guys because braid 
Sure. Raid. And what's going on with her is a pretty big like mystery in mm-hmm. Starsight, in Cytonic, and I just love her shooting Winzik in the face. Just like, yeah, we're mm-hmm. we're not doing this. Mm-hmm. And and then Spencer being like, oh my god. And then all the generals is like, oh, that's good. We're we're done with Thank that. Thank God for that. <laughs> this guy's an idiot. <laughs> I like narratively that the big bad because this series is so focused on Spencer. I love that the big bad of the series is the evil Spencer and it's not true. the superiority <laughs> itself. Hmm. It's it's almost like a Marvel movie villain. It's the evil Spencer with Cytonic powers. And the evil Spencer tries to bond to Delver too, but it doesn't work. But I actually mm-hmm. does work act really great. I actually really like it. <laughs> I, I think it's well done. I think they're good like parallels and foils to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um I like the way that that they bounce off of each other. And I'm going to say it. There was tension in some of their interactions. There's a ship waiting to happen there. Mm. They could be, they could have been a thing mm. if Brandon wasn't a coward. No, <laughs> I, uh, I have, that, that's a joke. But <laughs> I have a note on Debray that just says cat and mouse game hot. <laughs> because yeah it was like everything with the timer every time Bryce like and times mm. like oh my god yeah yeah oh the tension the tension's right there Brandon how did you miss this again <laughs> Spencer would never go for it oh, I'm afraid but, but I don't know I can see it yeah it's going back to the parallels between this book and um well of ascension where there was like a dark Allen. yeah uh, maybe yeah <laughs> she should have if there had been a dark vin it may have been a very different story we yeah, don't know I guess that's true. so so basically braid is zane yes braid's zane. but yeah. better and brandon better. doesn't realize it but better yeah. but yeah. better and brandon doesn't realize it yeah yeah and and we we admittedly can't have edgy name because we already have seen nightshade and nightshade <laughs> and dark shadow so it's like we can't we can't do another dark edgy name but i love just the superiority generals being like yeah we're not aggressive enough to actually wage this war so we need a human to do it and mm-hmm. I think there's been some people like, ah, that's that's a little odd, but I kind of loved it. And I loved just Braid's arrogance in all mm-hmm. of that mm-hmm. and just totally screwing up. And then like her fleets destroyed. It's like, well, time to go. But also oh the arrogance of her like locking up all the slugs and then mm. that totally biting her in the ass. I that love was them. so funny. I I love things like that. And so I, it was really nice to finally like be in her POV. Like I really liked that. And we couldn't do mm-hmm. it until she became in charge. Right. Because that would mm. give away what she's doing and yeah. what her plan is. Yeah. But I loved that. Another thing that I really liked about her point of view was how it started. Just like I, I think it's the first point of view that she gets uh, is make this mean something. Yeah. Those had been the last words yeah. her father had ever spoken to her. Make this mean something. And that hits so well for me. I'm like, it, it, the way that her motivation is about ultimately trying to give herself a purpose. And so, like, when you're in this situation where you are essentially nothing to all of these people and they only see you as a monster they only see you as one thing you're like okay what choice do i have but then to choose to be the best monster the one who finally conquers the universe if this is who they see me as then i'm going to take hold of this and make it my own and i'm going to make it mean something and that worked for me as a motivation yeah as soon as we got that POV in that line, 
everything clicked together for me because like i loved braid in this book she was fucking crazy (laughs) and i loved every moment of that but like she was just so erratic and spencer comments on it of i don't know who the real braid is and as Mm -hmm. soon as we get that line it all made sense that like the real braid is the one that has to win she has to reach that goal that she set whether it's like destroying the defiant and defeating people regardless of like any casualties or beating spencer at that jewel she was so obsessed with doing that jewel and beating spencer like she tried so hard to not make it show that she was obsessed but the number of times she brings it up it's like oh Mm -hmm. oh honey you you have to show that you're better than other people because otherwise you can't justify living like yep. that's your only justification for yourself and that's horrifying but the thing it reminded me of was jorgen losing his parents and the line that we get from them of do better than we did mm. and just that difference between mm-hmm. what his parents who were not great people said to him and like the path he went on from that of oh things can be better versus no just lean into it and At least the way, that's the way like, braid took it obviously yeah because she was what like eight yeah when like she eight, was taken? something like that so yeah if you take if you tell an eight-year-old who's being kidnapped yeah just like do what they say but like make it worth it that's not gonna that's not a good message to leave your child with. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting because we find out that her parents were uh, executed several years later, and it kind of comes across like they were rebels almost. Like that that's the implication I got that they were executed because they did something wrong. Well, that the explanation that's given is like, oh, like, they got somewhere they weren't supposed to and made people feel threatened. But there's also a line saying on a little later on of Braid saying like, I don't know how true that is. It could have just been Winzik removing potential influences on my life. Yeah. So it's like, I think she thinks like they were just executed so that they couldn't reconnect with Braid. Mm -hmm. I could see there being meaning in, in them being rebels or, or something like that. But I could also see just them just being people, humans, who did actually just like maybe try to escape, maybe not. I don't know what happened. They got out and frightened someone important. And that was enough for them to just die. Sure. Uh, maybe uh, them being Braid's parents played in on it as well. And so, so it was like, okay, any little excuse and you're gone. But to me, that is the way that they would have been just the way that the superiority did not care and just how easy it was that they just died and that was it. And now Braid is just left with them having died for some silly petty reason because the superiority sucks. And I I think that would also play into her trying to make it all worth something because if she just lost her parents for no reason, then what even is there? I like how she mirrors Spensa, like saying, yeah, I'm the weapon. That's that's what I'm doing. That's that's what I need to do. I need to be the best weapon, the best general. Mm-hmm. I am going to finally be the human who conquers the galaxy. I loved that. That was great. Yeah. Going back to like Braid's obsession with the duel, because mm-hmm. I, I kind of want to... Re- read around like braid's final line Mm -hmm. because it's also my favorite chapter transition in the book Mm -hmm. which is uh she was almost free spencer didn't realize what a shot hit hit braid's shield not from behind but from in front from her escape route there to her shock a group of starfighters had just appeared an entire flight Cheating, she said in the decom. Spencer, you coward. This was supposed to be a duel. Just the two of us. That's the thing, Spencer said back. It's not just the two of us, Braid. I'm not alone. I will never be alone. 
I'm part of something bigger. And when you pick a pot fight with one of us, dot, 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 I, chapter change, that's, you pick it with all of us. I finished. It just <laughs> going through the, the entire list mm-hmm. of everyone mm-hmm. and Spencer finally like realizing that's like, I'm not alone. Uh, mm. yeah, that's so good. Just, and then just blast braid in the face. I'm like, yeah, that's what mm-hmm. I mean. That's what we need here. I think- and, and I, I do love like the, 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 uh, the roll call of Skyward Fly. My favorite one, Stal- Skyward 9, Shiver said, they say we need call signs. I'm thinking Stalwart. We're here. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so like, I like, she's just there. And like, I don't know what's going on, but sure. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we were told to get in the ship and we were going to battle, but okay, we're here now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I really like from that scene um, the the bit where she talks about cheating because even mm-hmm. the braid is hundred percent fine with cheating herself. I think mm-hmm. she was legitimately upset that Spencer cheated because mm-hmm. then suddenly it's like, oh, I can't win this game because you're cheating. That's not fair. Even if I'm gonna cheat, yep. that's mm-hmm. fine. I'm allowed to cheat, but you're not allowed to cheat. Yep. And it really goes back to that mindset of like, if she doesn't win, she's nothing. Mm-hmm. Like, there's yeah. nothing that validates her if she can't show that she's the best. Yeah, because uh, it is a callback to earlier when she and Spencer are doing that dog fight, and then it ends, and it's like uh, Spencer realizes, like, oh, this was never a real duel. Like, mm. Braid was in control the entire time. Yep. Like, she was cheating. Yeah. It's like. That's what you get. Yep. Double standards right there. Mm-hmm. Oh, yep. one other braid thing is I love when Spensa, after the mission, Jorgen's upset and Spensa, you know, tries and things. And she just says, so can I go dual braid to the death? And Jorgen just goes, who? <laughs> I, I, I just it's like oh right yeah you you weren't here for like any of this like i i love the skyward flight people be like what are you even talking about i have no idea and that really goes back to kind of spence's central problem of she doesn't understand how to communicate with people and like when she starts getting better is because she does start opening up those communication lines. But the fact that she's just assuming that people know these important things about her that have happened while she was away for like, mm. what, eight weeks? And you're always like, I, I'm your boyfriend and like the Admiral of this fleet. And I don't know who this person is, but they're apparently like important to your story. Yeah. Why have you not told me about this person? I'm your boyfriend. Why haven't you told me about your arch enemy? Why haven't you told me about your girlfriend? <laughs> 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 my yes. name's Spencer, and this is my boyfriend, Jorgen, and this is my girlfriend, Braid. Oh, man. I feel like Jorgen and Braid would not get along at all oh, in no. any way. Like, that's, that's, that, would not, that would not go well. Um, you mean the rules guy and the rule breaker? Yeah. Yeah, because Braid just breaks all the rules. Yes. Delvers? Yeah, so let's talk about the Delvers. Mm, So I really liked how the Delvers were dealt with in this book. And what's that smile, Ian? Is it because (laughs) the answer is all you need is love? And it. (laughs) Yes. It's like like the Delvers are solved the exact same way that they're solved in in this book. It's way (laughs) better earned in this book than Star Sight. Way better. Like the entire book is about that. Oh, because the Delver stuff obviously linked with the slugs. The little Delvers love that line. So So cute. So good. But that one slug comfort that gets murdered oh, oh my god i can't believe brandon horrifying. made me love that slug so much and then just <laughs> murdered yeah. them in, in like the same chapter as we learned that their name and i'm like oh people are gonna people are gonna die people yeah. will die for this and it's like all of the inhibitor slugs <laughs> refusing to be rescued yeah it's like no it's like we're in this together it's the only way we can survive like i can't Mm -hmm. leave them behind there was way more setup here 
we had all the aspect with the tortured slugs, which uh, was a plot line. Loved that. Mm-hmm. And needing to free the slugs and giving the slugs citizenship. Nice. That was smart. Mm-hmm. Then Mbot comes with his plan, right? Mm-hmm. And then Chet's also realizing this too and connecting with like what Spencer and Chet were talking about. And so it's like these four things together that work mm-hmm. really well and to have the Delvers feel like they're not alone. Whereas I do not think it is nearly as earned as Insta is. is well, Starsight can, was not nearly as good. I think you can look at like now across the whole series and I, I very much agree. I think Starsight as a book is still disappointing because of this. And this book is much better because of how it's been set up. But if you look at just like the themes across the series, like mm. in Starsight, Spencer is alone. She's only got Ember and Doomslug. She's a spy in this place that she doesn't know with enemies surrounding her. She's cut off from everyone that she cares about. And when we get the power of friendship ending, it feels really dissatisfying because it didn't feel earned because she didn't have the power of friendship connected to her. Whereas in this, everything is building up to it everything is starting to be connected together so when we do get to that ending it's like oh actually that makes a lot of sense because look at all of these other things that have come together that boil down to the power of friendship and the power of love and being together and working together instead of working alone which is what spencer was doing in star side and i think when you compare them that way it a really interesting like narrative comparison the books themselves are still very different to read it's also that like we know more about the delvers as well whereas in star sight mm-hmm. we absolutely didn't know any of that and so it felt like wow that worked okay all right there's also the comparison between Spencer and the Delvers. Like the entire first half of the book, Spencer wants to do what the Delvers did. She wants to become this emotionless weapon and she just locks all of her mm, emotions away. Mm, that that's true. Her. That's and true. she can't do that because she's human and humans do not have programming that lets them lock away her emotions mm. and just work on like the roach roteness of things whereas yeah. delvers do and like going through that she now has a very real empathy that she can connect with the delvers with regardless of even chat like she's gone through something similar to them and now knows what that feels like and like what they went through and then she's got everything with chet on top of that giving her that like echo and feedback of no, this is what we went through as well. And this is hard for me to accept. And she's trying to teach Chet how to accept it. And I think without realizing that's helping her accept her situation mm-hmm. and helping her like mm-hmm. connect again with her friends and with her emotions that she literally cannot get rid of. Yeah, it's good. It's like, I, I'm, just still fine with star sight ending the way it does like it, it it's just always worked for me like i don't know why i also feel like it's an important building block to get here like we've seen it is possible to get through to delvers but the thing is that yes spensa made a connection with chet in star sight she doesn't understand that so she can't use it as a solution to solve all of the Delvers. Sure. She she stumbled into part of the solution, and we don't really know why that worked, but we know it did, so we know it's important, I which actually, just helped this. I kind of disagree about Starsight being uh, like the exact same thing as we got in Defiance, because it didn't feel like a power of friendship or power of love thing to me. It felt very specifically tied into Spencer's arc in Starsight, where it was, uh, we are people. We yeah, are that's true. worthy of existing. That was specifically what she was trying to communicate. And that related directly to her realizing that the aliens were people, that they were no different, that they like shouldn't just be wiped out because 
they were trying to wipe out humans. It was very specifically, uh, we are people just like, like we are all people. I also feel like that kind of worked better for me than in Defiant, where it was just like, no, you have to process your emotions like I am processing my emotions of Grand Grand. It felt very, like, sudden and mm -hmm. blunt to me. So I have a counterpoint to you, Ian, cool. of, you, of your whole, like, our site being as like coming to learn that all of all of the specs are people and spensa learning this aliens of the superiority are also people 100 percent valid i i agree i like that but also the important thing that happens here that solves everything is the slugs realizing the delvers are people too and kind of like like Oh, like those poor slugs, they're hurting so much. We're going to just incorporate them into our um, slug love network, which is exactly what the Delvers needed and kind of got reciprocated. It's like the like those poor slugs, you're hurting the little Delvers, them both viewing the others as part of themselves. Great parallel. That was a good but parallel. It, yeah. I absolutely agree that... I we are a little bit making fun of the end of Star Sight with the power of friendship. I, I I do understand that, and a, as people were talking, I'm like, I mean, it does work with the arc of that book. I do still think the arc there is less strong than this one. I think this arc is much better. That's fair. In in my opinion, but I will also agree that as we said at the top, this book makes the other books in the series much better. Right. And this book makes the end of Star Sight and everything we learn in Cytonic. The decisions she made in Cytonic, like I loved how Chet's like, I mean, we can still go to the nowhere. This sucks, but like we, we can go back. And Spencer's like, no, we we chose this. This is the right thing to do. And making Chet understand that. Like it's it's those sorts of things that really helped that. I don't know if Starsight could have worked for me per mm -hmm. personally, but like this book worked because we went through all of that stuff in a way, right? There is a wonderful line about the thing with Chet where mm -hmm. he's saying, but what if we go to the nowhere and everything will stop and then the pain will stop. And it's like what she wanted at the beginning of the book, like she wanted the pain to stop, but it's also basically the same um, deal she was offered at the Underside Tonic. It's like, what if I get peace instead of having to go back to war and go back to everything that hurts, except mm -hmm. on like the next scale, because it's not even just that she gets peace, she gets to stop the bad emotions. And there is this incredible line that I think describes both situations really well, that the nowhere wasn't peace, it was the illusion of peace. Mm -hmm. And Spencer getting to that point, because I think like the end of Cytonic, her decision makes sense, but it's kind of hard to put into words why it makes sense, like what she's doing when she decides to go back to the somewhere. And I think that line like encapsulates it perfectly, but I think even Spencer wouldn't have put it that way at the end of Cytonic. She just like had that gut feeling that she had to go back. She had to help. And now she understands why she had to go back and why she had to help and why she can't choose to just turn off the bad emotions and make everything stop and why she needs to keep going. And oh, I love that line so much. And it like it kind of gets into yes, you can escape into the nowhere, escape all the bad feelings, or you can try to process through them. And why choosing to process them is the harder choice is because it's not just one choice. You have to continue choosing to process because you can always go and escape into the nowhere mm -hmm. and learning that like no it's worth it to continue choosing to be hurt in this way because it will lead out rather than 
remaining stuck in it. The ending of this book just really brought so many things together for me. And I I really liked it. I like books that we just have Brandon Avalanche and like as soon as Braid shoots Winsick, we're we're in ending mode. We're we're just in ending mode the whole time. We just have a few chapters of Spencer captured. And then we're just we're in the end game now. And then we're in the end yeah. game. And so part three is just the end of the book. <laughs> and I love that. I, I will admit it was probably my least favorite part of the book, to be oh. honest. Uh, I felt like everything. Well, I mean, other than already mentioned, like things left hanging. I felt like other everything wrapped up well. I liked the epilogue. I liked the last couple chapters. It felt like a satisfying uh, ending to me. But just like the climax in general, this is entirely personal preference. Giant space battles Mm. don't do it for me. Sure, sure. So I was just like, oh, wow. A very large portion of the book is just like enormous space battles. Space, lasers, tons of ships, more ships. Both sides (laughs) have ships. There's a big ship. We care about There's the big ship. Space worms. We're going, to, <laughs> space we're going worms. to get the slugs. There's space worms. And so I was just like, eh. I'm mm-hmm. I, I like I really liked the uh teleporting fight between Spencer and Braid, though. That, that was, was epic cool. and awesome. That, that was, was cool. cool. Yeah, that's that's fair. If you don't like giant like I think there's a lot of readers who just like don't like big battles also like battle tactics and things like that mm-hmm. you know like that could that can go for space battles or like you know fancy battles right like any mm-hmm. large scale battle it's like eh, eh. something i did find interesting about the ending is that we're so used to spencer being the pilot right like she's the one out there getting all the ships and uh shooting down the enemy and in the final battle, she's not. She's mm-hmm. stuck to the yeah. wall, yes. like watching Bray do all of this stuff. And what I really like that Brandon did do is that we get all the different POVs. Mm-hmm. And I think this helps so that we get more than just like seeing it from one side and seeing it from like the side that's attacking detritus and the people that we are rooting for. But it also kind of gave more scale to the battle as well. Like mm-hmm. when you jump from Braid to Grand Grand to Kimmelin and it just like showed how vast it actually was. Mm-hmm. And I just really, really liked that. I'm also yeah. kind of surprised that there wasn't a cutoff between like shooting Winsick and the battle and making that part four, I did find it really weird that part three was just that entire thing. Yeah, yeah. but that's fair. I really like the choice Brandon made that even in this first person series, it's like, I mean, we got to do the POV switching to get the <laughs> yeah, whole it's, scale. It's, that's Brandon it's Hallmark. Classic. It's a classic. And it mm. worked great. It happened at the end of Skyward. So, I mean, it's not like it's new to this series you for the series yeah oh yeah we see moriamer that's right yeah we see moriamer no, that's, that's i mean true. i mean skyward i mean ironsides oh right mm-hmm. yeah there was a little bit no, of I mean, that it does eh. it happens at the end of star sight too i don't yeah. think it happens in cytonic no, but that doesn't. was always a very spencer focused yeah, book sure, but sure, all, sure. all the other books have at least one other point of view so it felt like a natural evolution. Yeah. Also, just having the novellas and having those points of view as well, I think it makes mm-hmm. it easier to just shove other points of view in anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Look, I'm doing the Brandon Sanderson podcast and running 17 Shard for a reason, and there are certain things of Brandon that I just like, and I like his big battles and his climaxes, and give me a whole half of a book that's climax. I'm like, Mm, good. You like big battles and you cannot lie. I cannot lie. I want <laughs> I want an even bigger battle than Oathbringer in uh Stormlight 5. And I yeah, that's mm-hmm. I know that's maybe a controversial take, but I'm like, ah, eh, you know, we could have more. We could have more POVs. We could have more. Just have it be well, the I, most I thing. the POVs. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I like the POVs. I just felt exhausted. Which oh, I man. felt like was the point oh, of it, so but good. at the same time, I love that ending. 
Eric, just read Wheel of Time. There's the yeah, like, I know, I know, two hundred page last battle chapter oh, yeah. and a memory of flight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, if Brandon stops writing, you know, books, then maybe I'll have time to read a non-Brandon Sanderson book. Uh, but that that would be great. I would love to have time to read something that doesn't have Brandon's name. I know it eventually has Brandon's name on it in Wheel of Time. I, I understand that, but. I, I have like other books that are like really good. So I hear <laughs> that I haven't read them. I have so much to do, guys. I'm so, so, so tired. Jess can attest. I'm very tired. Speaking of battles in this book, uh, I wanted to talk about the battle at Luna. Yeah. Because I really liked how Brandon portrayed war in mm. this book. Mm -hmm. And it's something that is really hard to do, I think, because in a lot of other books that I've read, authors have to balance on that line between, okay, our good guys need to stay the good guys, but they're also going to do bad things. And we can't just have them constantly be like the heroic people because then that just doesn't kind of work a lot of the time and seems a bit cliche and just doesn't always work in a war focused book. So I really liked in the Battle of Loon were the bad guys. And I thought that was very, very clear. And everything Spencer did to first try and prevent casualties, but then just wrecked everything. <laughs> And killed so many people and not just the, they weren't even military. They were like police, apparently, that were battling her. Like all the civilians she killed with the buildings. And she knows it, but then she gets the guilt afterwards of, well, if I had started earlier, then maybe Ned wouldn't have lost his arm. Yep. And just that back and forth of, well, we are the good guys, but this was a very bad thing that we did. And we know we're the bad guys. Like there's actually a line, I think, at the end of one of the chapters of we are the human scourge that people will yeah. remember. Like yes. the way we remember the Krell, that's what people will remember of us because of this. Uh, and it's it's just, it's so good. And there's two different moments in it that are uh, complete opposite that I really, really liked. The first was um, Spencer's trying to avoid shooting anyone. Jorgen comes on the line and says, you haven't fired a single shot. And Spencer responds with, I don't need to. And at that point, she's got six ships on her tail. So yeah, like she didn't really need to. But then once she does start firing and at the end, Jorgen again comes on the line and says, good job. Yeah. And she has to cut herself off from saying shut up to yeah. him. And just that difference between that, like she knows that what she's done is a terrible thing that was also necessary for her people. I don't think other books always get to that level of look at how bad we are as the good guys. So I thought that was really well done. And then, of course, we get to the last battle where it's like, no, 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 we're the good guys. And then Braid's the bad guys. And look at how many people Braid's killing. So it, it does kind of go a little bit into like the general tone of good guys and bad guys um, mm -hmm. in a battle. But yeah, I just really appreciated how Brandon did the Luna mission. Mm -hmm. I liked also how like Skyward Flight also had a moment. It's like, see, yeah, so that was like real bad, right? And it's like, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, I'm not cool with that at all. It, it like leads right into, you know, Spencer trying to find another way for, in the mission in part two, right? Of getting, you know, the broadsiders to attack the other Eclipity mm -hmm. Stone bases. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, love that we got some Cytonic people in here. That's great. That's great. That 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 worked out real nice for me. I liked that. We got all three of Spence's flights into one flight in this book. Mm, Starside's yes. still a little weak. It, like she, look, Vapor wasn't here. Ian, I need I need Hesho was Hesho? here. I know. I Hesho. know. It's not enough for Starside. One person counts. 
Yeah. yeah you have yeah, Hesho yeah. and then um, Hana, like the other, um, or is Kauri in there? Kauri. Oh, Kauri, Kauri, Kauri was, was nice. They're, they're both. Yeah, they're, they're both, both I think. There. Technically Braid's there as well. Technically Braid, yes. Yeah. And we got mention of Vapor being yeah. just <laughs> somewhere <laughs> and Spencer just magically connected with like everyone in the universe. Yeah, like, it's like, that I almost I don't heard understand. Vapor was here. It's like, okay, Braid, <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. It, like that whole section where Spence is thinking of all of her friends, like giving her kind of almost friendship energy is yes, how I'm thinking yes, about it. That's exactly what There's it is. There's just a scene at the very end of Naruto that's exactly the same thing. Uh, this this is so like shonen of. anime energy. Like <laughs> Yu-Gi-Oh! It does this all the time, I remember. It's and just I like, love it. I, you <laughs> know, I, I love it too. And that's... Yeah, I, I, I really liked it. I thought it worked. It just works better here than Star Side. I don't know. It just, it, just, it just works a lot better. Well, she had more friendship energy to work yeah. with. Yes. Obviously. That's true. I really like this book. Every time I've read this book, I've liked it more and more. Uh, I think <laughs> the first time I read it, I was definitely irritated. Bears older. <laughs> what the hell, guys? And I've, I've come to terms with it. And so I like it more now uh same with same with i think a lot of brandon books like the more when you do a reread it's like okay i know what this book is and so i can appreciate mm -hmm. what this book is uh but still that that entire last battle is, is is tight and i loved just detritus killing all of braid's fleet that she just casually throws away and you are right jess there is that element of it's like, oh man, war is bad. But admittedly, I think that's more like the civilian aspects. Like the actual fighters are like, yeah, we kill these guys. Mm -hmm. But well, it's interesting because we get like Braid just not caring. It's like, yeah. I'll just throw these people away. Yep. And then one of her yes. uh, ministers yes. is like, you know, there's people in there, right? And I think yep. like that's the turning point for the people working with her yes. that are like, oh maybe we shouldn't have put her in charge like oh, maybe she's too aggressive <laughs> maybe like, she's too aggressive like oh we wanted an aggressive human but maybe we shot too far it is funny because they were going for we need someone aggressive and mission accomplished you did find someone to do that she's like i i need to be the most aggressive i need to be the best there ever was at being an aggressive horrible human sky we flat is great Skyward book, Flight well, is they, they are just the best. So mm -hmm. funny. Uh, I was thinking of you, Jess, with the the Ned stuff and the poetry, and just how <sighs> Ned Ned's smart. And you 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 mm -hmm. called it from the very beginning. God, just the C chapter five where Ned and Kimmelin are like, "Yo, we're gonna hang out on your." Uh, your ladder while you try and get your stuff out already because we know that you need human interaction <laughs> was so good and ned with his mustache <laughs> and everyone's just like no it's so bad kimlin just straight out be like no it's terrible mercy like, killing i'm not even gonna beat around the bush it's so bad ned um <laughs> and there's a line from spencer where she's like he kind of had done this on purpose, right? And he totally did it on purpose. He has to have done it on purpose. Like, he's so good at noticing what people need, but then providing it, like, so subtly that they don't realize they're getting it. And mm -hmm. I love it so much. Ned is such a good character. I also love it quite a lot. But I did find that one line kind of weird because it's like, Spencer, you had this revelation back in Skyward. You had this whole thing about, oh, he does all the jokes in the silly act for us. Yeah, it's like on he's actually smart. And so I was like, why, why are you having this realization again? We already had this. Uh, but I do. I, I love him doing it. It's great. She just forgot that in the nowhere. She had to refigure it out. I mean, to be honest, I forgot that Fair there was enough. that line, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Real um, talk. But I loved Arturo's existential crisis after he realizes Ned is sh quoting Shakespeare. <laughs> that was that that was I loved that. 
<laughs> Particularly because like Ned, Arturo, and Jorgen went to school together. So they've been mm -hmm. friends for a very long time. And Arturo just didn't know this. Oh, that's so funny. And it was so funny when Ned, I think Ned said to Hesho, oh, don't worry about Arturo. He's just a little slow there. <laughs> it's just <laughs> incredibly funny. I, I can listen to this banter and I will with the Skyward Legacy. We'll talk about that a bit, too. But <laughs> I love the banter. The Cytonic crew and the Starsight crew are just not as good. They're just not as good. It's, it's facts. On average, yeah. I'll agree. It does help that we had three beefy novellas to beef them up as well, mm -hmm. admittedly, at this stage. So I think I like Skyward Flight as a unit the best. I do think uh, the Starsight crew had some good characters. I, I agree oh, with definitely. that. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I think going forward, like, we're definitely going to see Vapor again. You have to like, see Vapor again. I would be again. so surprised if we don't see Vapor again. And we've already got Hesho back. And I think we are going to see more of the Cytonic crew. Probably not as much as Vapor. But yeah, I think we're going to see more of them in the future. Yeah. Maybe eventually, if time goes on long enough, we'll have more of again. <laughs> nah, How I long do Dion's need to mature? mature? I don't know. I will say one thing about Ned that I didn't like in this book. Okay. Uh, I, I did really like that he lost his arm. Uh, that's a terrible thing to say. I, I really liked that scene. I thought it was like really worrying and dramatic of, no, he's alive, but something really bad has happened and we don't know how bad it is. And like, we have to deal with that later. But like, we now know that something bad has happened. But then in the scene where they're washing the ships, he's like, yeah, I'm going to get a prosthetic and just be able to do things again. I'm like, that kind of takes away from sure. all of the stakes of making him lose his arm. <laughs> so I, I was a little bit annoyed by that. Also, since when can they make prosthetics like that? That's like really advanced. Like maybe it's something that the, the space stations could do, but I don't know. Like, I don't think we've seen that level of technology from the defiance at this point yeah and spencer does comment on it and being surprised by like how advanced the prosthetics could be which makes me wish it had come from like oh this is urdale tech like they mm. have yeah. advanced prosthesis yeah and just like it, and then maybe it taking a little while to adapt that to human physiology. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than, oh, just humans have had this the whole time. I'm like, have they? And like, maybe that's what it'll be in the end and we'll get some sort of explanation like that. But I kind of wish we got it now because <laughs> yeah. it does just come across like, oh, humans can just do this. I'm like, but why? How? It's possible that Ned being like, oh, I'm going to be a badass cyborg is like kind of him masking like the trauma of it, admittedly. But like, yeah, we don't get a lot of that, like anything in this book. Right. Hmm. So, f yeah, that's fair. It's also it's just kind of the it's the reversal thing. Hmm. right? It, it's the oh, I'll do something bad, but don't worry, guys, I'll just reverse it so that there aren't as many consequences or like. The consequences that you would assume just aren't there. So, like Hesha dying, <laughs> which the series suffers from. <laughs> cool. Well, there's lots to talk about. Uh, we got through most things we wanted to talk about, but let's let's talk about what we're thinking for the future with Skyward Legacy because the universe will continue in Skyward Legacy. What do you guys think of that? Are you excited? Any Thoughts or predictions and things. I mean, of course, we're excited. Jen Z is writing more Skyward books, and we liked the Skyward books she did before. So, True. yes, more space than like the novellas. I I mm -hmm. imagine it's going to be excellent. I think she said that they're not going to be about the space exploration, though. So, just 
At yeah, some yeah. Point. She said uh, that yes. they're not. They're not going to be about Spencer and Kimmel. And she was like, they're going to be yeah. about Skyward Flight. And those two kind of went on their own direction and left Skyward Flight. Sure. So it is not about mm. them. It does feel like we have to get like old Earth stuff, though, right? I. I hope so. <laughs> I'm leaning more towards like old earth portals, like figments, like Brandon might be saving for when he comes back to sky, to the side over. Mm. So it's like, I don't really know what the plot is going to be. I mean, given what like this book says, that's certainly the impression you get from it, right? It's like, oh, Spence is going to go off, do her own thing and explore these other things. And then when we hear... Yeah, Spence is not in Scared Legacy. That's going to be Brandon's thing. So it's like, what are we doing? But mm-hmm. I could yeah. see a split where some of the loose threads Jancy's doing, but some of them Brandon's doing. I think Old Earth Brandon's going to do, mm. considering she's exploring unknown and dangerous planets. Mm. Like that seems like an Old Earth setup. Uh, I think Spencer's going to do things for the figments because I think that ties in really well with an Mbot backstory and probably Vapor in with that as well. But the other things, like, I don't know, maybe even like the stuff in the nowhere with the actual um, portals being locked, like, that seems like a Spencer thing as well. So, yeah, I don't really know what uh, what Jancy's going to do, but I am excited to see more Skyward Flight things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's kind of a thing where the side-overse is continuing with Jancy's, with, with Skyward Legacy. The Skyward series is Spencer's story that is not continuing at this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we'll theoretically be continuing in the future when Brandon comes back to it. I hate how I agree with this because I don't want it to be some nebulous thing that like we're only just barely now hearing that Brandon plans on doing more books himself and we have no idea about any of them. Zero information. Probably because he hasn't planned out a whole lot of it himself and so I'm kind of just like but I don't want to wait for a maybe and wait for who knows how long to get these answers. I just want to have the answers. (laughs) That's yeah. why I think some of this has to be in Skyward Legacy. Like, it can't just all be for mm-hmm. Spencer, you know? Because that's, I feel like these are the things that, like, people are like, but Especially what about with, Earth, guys? Come on! <laughs> you know? Especially with him building it up in Defiant and, yeah, like, exactly. reminding people of it. It's like, okay, what are you reminding us for yeah. if you're not going to get to it for another 10 years? Yeah, so, like, if that's the case, I'm going to complain on this show. (laughs) It's like the way I'm seeing it is that I'm, I'm, I have to bring in star Wars. Yeah, sure. Um, It's okay. We've gone the entire episode, not talking about sky, uh, about star Wars. Sure. But there is the Skywalker saga, which Mm. is about the Skywalker family. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole bunch of other really cool star Wars stuff. There's some pl- like Skyward is the Spencer saga, and th- it will continue in the future. Now we're getting like Rogue One and Andor. I'm hoping all the we're filling in the edges of this of the universe and leaving some plot lines for S- Spencer to explore in the future. And yes, um, Dragon Steel 2023 was the first time Brandon mentioned he was going to be writing more books himself in the series yeah see that's that's fair but i don't think this works as well as saying hey we're gonna have some extra side stuff right when you're putting Mm -hmm. out books of a certain length in some consistent interval that's the main show and right like that's the main program we're doing here and so for me sky these skyward legacies i feel like are gonna be about this long and they're gonna yeah and, and and things and so then that's the main show and so we can't just drop all of the plot lines that are cool that are hooks for a sequel series and then just not do it for a decade legacy is also kind of being branded at least as far as i've seen as the sequel series to what we've seen so far so it 
it would be strange to have all of these plot threads just not touched for a while uh and we don't have any information on like if when brandon's gonna write this and we know that he's really busy with a bunch of cosmere stuff for the next 10 years so is he gonna write this as like an alternative that he can bounce off of when he needs a break or is he gonna find other time but yeah it's all a little bit up in the air and that that's nerve-wracking Brandon, I thought your whole point was you're trying to close some doors so you can <laughs> focus on things. But he he's like, I got to have my break books. <laughs> I guess. Something it's like I he closes think. one door so he can open two more. Yeah, obviously. Great. great. <laughs> Something I do think that Legacy is going to look into is the whole deal with the superiority and hmm. like, rebuilding it getting a new government whatever kind of happens going forward Mm -hmm. the and the also the um the alliance between the delvers and the slugs i think is going to be a big part of it and like what the state of like like how do cytonics fit in with that yeah because like that's that's definitely a question yeah it 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 has to right like you you cannot write any other books in the series without like delving into those (laughs) delving yeah yeah i want to say jancy has said skyward legacy take um kicks off like very close to the end of defiant whereas like figuring out with what's happening with old earth I feel like is a longer term problem. So it's like, yeah, yeah like we yeah. figure out what's going on with old earth in two years from the end of defiant. Yeah. Well, there's like plenty of stuff like to deal with in yeah. that time. Yeah. Like the end of defiant is kind of like, Oh, we toppled an empire and now we have to deal with the consequences of that. So that there is a lot of in world stuff that immediately has to be dealt with. Sure. So, presumably like i see looks at a lot of that yeah yeah i'm a little concerned but i i have faith that that jancy has a plan and that's mm-hmm. going to be pretty sweet um and that if she needs um cool ideas brandon will have them give me give me something for a big space battle I, okay Th- this is this is not on skyward legacy but it was pretty cool to see evan's song again from defending elysium even so yeah oh that's in defending elysium yeah mm-hmm. it, it's yeah, yeah. the, it's the there, space there's station a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a copper mine article and everything oh, beforehand yeah yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah so it's like yeah shout out to defending elysium not at all what i pictured it to be no didn't not at all expect floating space rectangle no no not my mental image at all but cool also i guess there's a hint uh that spencer says Hmm, these Tanasi, even though they're a founding superiority member, maybe they're a little too aggressive, and so they just kind of shunt them over here. Maybe there's a story in here. Like, that's, that's like, basically a line in the book. So, mm-hmm. maybe we'll learn more about Tanasi and things. Yeah. I think there's, like, one of the major races that we still haven't even met. I, can't I thought remember we've which met one. all the main superiority races, but yeah, I... Cause the- it's the Dions of the Varvax and the Tanasi are the the main three. And then there was Heklo and then one other, Heklo. I think. Yeah, maybe it's the one? three that pilot the drones. Oh. I think there's a third one we haven't uh, met. The Burl? No, Burl wasn't no, one of Burl those. Wasn't. No, because these these are uh, all prime intelligence ones. Because because they listed them in Star Sight, right? Yeah. Uh, what? Because I think what? it was the um, Tanasi, the Heklo, and something. Oh, oh no, no, no. You are right. You are right. Yes. Which one of us is right? <laughs> uh Jess is right, sorry. Uh, okay. Sorry, by default, I'm always talking to Jess. <laughs> <laughs> uh the the last one is the Cambric. Presumably from oh, Cambry. From Cambry. Oh. Where the slugs are meant to be. Supposedly. From. Probably not, but at least that's hmm. what the official superiority story is. So, yeah. So, we have Varvax, Dions, and then, yeah, Lys Cambric, Tanasi, and Heklo. So, we've met the Tanasi and Heklo, but not the Cambric. 
don't think we know anything. Well, I don't think we know anything about them. Nope. Mm-hmm. Gen C. I completely forgot that there was even another race that came from Cambry <laughs> besides no, the this, slugs and whatever the slugs hide from. This, this is unless the Cambry are what the slugs are hiding from. Yeah, I think it's more. I, I doubt even the slugs are actually from Cambry. Kind of as we said on span reads that I'm just like mm, probably not, and that's just and the like, story. It would kind of make sense if, like, the Cambric are one of the founding members of the, mm-hmm. like, yeah, we'll rewrite our history so that, like, we, oh, yeah, like, here's all the records of, like, this is what the Tanix are. Mm. We, we've always had them on our planet. They're a problem. Wouldn't it be funny if the Cambric were elevated to being in charge of the superiority because that's a species that actually knows what the Tanix do, and so they're like, well, I guess we can't kill all of you, so we we have to elevate you oh, to yeah. this high high level. That's plausible as hell to me. Yeah, like well, and then we just don't see them. So it's like you know they're they're import they're important. But they're over there. You know that sounds like a superiority thing to do to me. Uh, anyway, cool that cool. Jancy, explore the Cambric. <laughs> Cool. Mm-hmm. What are they? What are the weird space aliens and things? I, I do like seeing more space aliens, but I, I am really interested to see how the new status quo is going to be for the universe and mm-hmm. how the Cytonics deal with the Delvers and the Slugs and, yeah. and things. Because that's maybe the one hanging thing where it's like, we solved the Delver problem, but like, what what about the Cytonics though? Really? Yeah, because it's specifically like left open of the c- yeah. cytonics haven't figured things out as the Delvers, mm-hmm. even if the slugs have. Love the slugs getting their full rights. They're sapient. They're little Delvers here, guys. Well, Love little that. Delvers. <sighs> no, the slugs are slugs. The Delvers are just big slugs. The big slugs. True. <laughs> the big slugs and little Delvers. <laughs> can can we get? Can we get a plushie that's like? Six times the size of this. That's just a, a Delver plushie. Can we get that? Like one of those giant squishables. Maybe it's like like a beanbag chair. That's just a Delver. Mm-hmm. And then there's mm-hmm. yeah. That's doesn't seem really sustainable to store those. So that'd probably be pretty expensive. But you know, Dragon we'll can buy another a, warehouse. It's fine. If it's a beanbag chair, they're actually pretty easy to store because you just don't include the beads and then people have to buy them separately. And you just sell the cover. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, but what if we got a giant That was an option. Yeah, I I can't say I've ever bought a beanbag chair. I've I've sat in them. They've they've existed. We've had we've had beanbags, but that was when I was like a little kid. Yeah. I was involved with the buying of them. I'm just like, I haven't. Mm-hmm. Anyway, this doesn't have anything to do with anything. Uh, do, do we have other Skyward legacy thoughts or other final thoughts about the book? I, I have one final thought. Okay. Um, as I was going through my notes, um, and by notes, I, I literally mean a, a picture I took on my phone of nice. my tablet. <laughs> I, I do know that you did that. Yes. I like mm-hmm. that. And it's going back to Braid, Braid's whole deal with the duel. And this is the start of her final chapter. Braid had no intention of dueling Spensa, of course. Fortunately, Spensa didn't know that. Uh, she'd always been about the contest, the fight, <laughs> while Braid had always seen the big picture, the larger scope. Like right now. I'm like, nah, nah that's not true, Braid. You're, you're the one with the problem here. I, I love getting villain POVs where like, the villains just convince themselves of a thing and we as readers are like, yeah, you're totally full of crap. <laughs> like, just, that's not true at all. I have a thing. Yep. This thing was actually probably my biggest problem with the book while reading it. Okay. I just don't want to get into it in depth. Okay. Uh, but while I was reading it, the thing that annoyed me the most was the treatment of the slugs in it. Yeah. Uh, not the in-world treatment, but the narrative treatment, because it felt like a departure from every single other book and depiction of them 
so far. It did not feel like what we got in previous Skyward books. It did not feel like what we got in the novellas. It was just like, suddenly, they're sapient now. They were equally as intelligent as humans. Uh, We are going to give them citizenship. And the entire time, I was just like, I like the slugs, but this feels like a weird jump because nothing I have seen in any of the other books would lead me to think that these are sapient creatures. Sentient, absolutely. But like, sapient on the level of humans? No. And so I was just like really surprised when Defiant leaned into that and turned it up to 11. And so I was just like, okay, this is... this. It, it almost reads to me like Brandon saw how much Jancy made people love the slugs, and understandably so, and went, oh, okay, people love slugs. I'm going to make a big focus on slugs. It's going to be just as important when they die as when humans die. We're going to make a big focus of trying to rescue them just as much as we are trying to rescue anyone else. They're going to be a big thing in the plot. Uh, I'm rambling on about this more than I meant to, but it really it came out of nowhere for me and it was like i like the slugs fine but where in the world why what anyway that's my weird rant about the book (laughs) yeah uh the only other thought i had was a out of world thought that's more about the book as a whole and about brandon's speech at dragonsteel con this year sure it's on youtube so definitely recommend it there's also a Stormlight interlude reading with it, so I'll, I'll put definitely a card recommend on that. the upper right of the screen. I'll put it there. But the whole speech was about the idea of liminality and being mm-hmm. in this middle ground between the end of something and the start of the next thing. And I think he gave the speech largely because, like, this series is ending and uh, Era 2 is ending. And, like, this series works really well, I think, with the idea of liminality because we know there's something else coming and we're moving mm-hmm. straight into it. But also just the themes in the book. Like, Spencer really has to deal with this struggle of coming back to her friends and things have changed and things have ended and now something new has come. And she has to step into that unknown and that's really scary for her and i think that's part of why she does push people away and i just couldn't stop thinking about this when thinking of brandon's speech and about the idea of liminality so yeah yeah as someone who was not at dragon seal i did watch on youtube it definitely is an interesting speech in the context of this book and in context of where Brandon is at his career right now. Yeah. I mean, Justin and I watched it on YouTube as well. <laughs> we, we were like, well, we don't want to go sit in a giant room full of people. Let's go back to our hotel and there was, relax. There was a giant line to get into the thing. And I'm like, we can just mm-hmm. be in bed and watch it. It's like, that, that sounds great. Yeah. I was, year, I was upstairs. Mm. I was upstairs watching it from like close to the balcony because I was like, I'm not going down there. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm gonna be no, up we, there with we, saw, we saw that place. That's that's a sweet place to to be there. Yeah, I like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, like last year, like the 17th card contingent, like didn't get in that line, and so like we got our seats way in the back, and there was like no one around us because nice. we did so like. I watched on a screen in a very big room and he was like, (laughs) like, it's just not worth waiting an hour before the seating for the release event happens, which itself is an hour before the release event. Like I could be in the exhibition hall. Like, what are we doing here, guys? Like (laughs) not doing that anyway. My final thoughts are I really like this book and I think it's easy to recommend this series and this series is so much better when you don't have to wait to get to Cytonic and then to leave Cytonic (laughs) and admittedly I think as a whole I appreciate Cytonic in here like we got there anyway let's head on over to who's that Cytoverse character This character is from Roshar. Menace. Tia. Tom. Mraze. Void in drag on a horse. <laughs> it's time for Who's That Cosmere Character? Ta. You know 
how the game is played. You send five clues in a character to WTCC at 17shot.com. I read each clue aloud. These guys have a chance to guess. Who's that? Well, normally it'd be Cosmere character. Don't send Cyderverse characters in. We're, we're, we're not going to do another Cyderverse episode until Skyward Legacy comes out. So don't, don't send those, but send in Cosmere characters. Mm-hmm. But right now, basically, I get these just basically from town fan. He's like, hey, do you need, do you need someone? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do. He's like, okay, I got you. <laughs> so these are both sent from town fan. Thanks, town. Yep. Our first character, first clue. This character is not human. Really narrows it down. I know. I know. Boom slug. Not boom slug. Chet. Not Chet. Rinnekin. It's not Rinnekin. I like that. Clue two. This character is very patient. Quick check. This is going to not be defiant characters, right? I I'll just say I got these yesterday. So Okay. Okay. So they could okay. be defying characters. They could be. That's what that's what happens when we record this very, very late. <laughs> so, so people have actually read the book. Um Kuna. Uh it is not Hesho, it's not Kuna. Doom Slug? It's not Doom Slug. Clue three. This character has eaten pudding in the middle of a battle. Oh, it's Juno. It is Juno. Hey. Because he was eating it during. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that shout... is a defiant reference. So. Oh, okay. Oh, it, was that referenced in defiant? Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. He's just like on his platform randomly eating um, p- um putting our yogurt in one of Jorgen's POVs and I thought it was amusing. Oh, that's really funny because I I didn't pick up on that at I all. I didn't pick up that either. I thought I got the one line about Juno where Hesho's like, I wasn't aware Juno hung out. <laughs> like, oh, that was, that was quite funny. Clue four was this character is a wise scholar in clue five. This character wears power armor. All right, this next one. See what you're doing, town fan. Who won? This character is not human. <laughs> chat. Chat? No, it's not chat. Peg. It's not peg. Tubbs. It's not tubs. Or chubs. Chubs. Chubs, yeah, that's One right. One of the slugs. I... Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. Clue two. This character was killed by a member of Skyward Flight. Winzik. Not Winzik. Who is the evil alien in Redon? The evil alien in Redon. Like the yeah. bad guy of the book. Oh, the, the other um, Dale Cytonic? Political leader? Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the political leader. Oh. Oh, uh, it's not him. Them. Okay. Lucky. It is not Lucky. I... Could be wrong, but I think I it just got confused. And Jess is correct, because I, I thought the Unity Cytonic was a different person than the leader of the Unity Party. But I think those are the same people. And that it is Quilin, right? And I, I think thought it was a different person. Is it a different person? Well, regardless The leader it, of the party from the Cytonic, yeah. I was thinking of the one who's the bad guy throughout the whole book. That like yeah, we were thinking of the the, the Cytonic. So yeah, 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 yeah. Quillen. Yeah. So anyway, it is Quillen. I I just I just got confused because okay. I thought there were two different people. So that's that's what I needed to check because I thought I was like, oh, was the bad guy like another guy, and Quillen was the the underdog. So anyway, sorry, I got confused. <laughs> but anyway, Jess gets it. Uh, the other that was really odd. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the next clue is this character is a Cytonic. Clue four, this character is a politician. And clue five, this character is Erdale. So there you go. Nice. Cool. We're done. We're out of here. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for waiting uh, for our slightly delayed podcast. We're recording this on Sunday and I'll get it out soon. Hey. 
thought, oh, that was, that was like, but <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why I grabbed it. Nice. Uh, and our next Sharkcast episode will be a live State of the Sanderson episode, which last year, State of the Sanderson came out on the day later. So we'll probably do it the day later to be safe. But I don't know. We'll, we'll figure out scheduling for that. So that'll it'll be around the 19th because that's when Brandon's birthday is. And yeah. So that's what we're doing. So you can follow us on 70 shardcom for all your news, discussion, theories, and fun you could ever want. You can talk about Defiant on our Discord and our forums. And you can subscribe on YouTube and, and follow us on the social meds. And yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. The social meds. Yes. That's... Follow us on those social meds. It, Do it. Isn't that, isn't that hip with the kids? If you're hip with the kids or are a kid who's, thir- who's 13 I plus. I think that's like a okay, millennial see, thing. Is, is that hip with the kids or not? Put that put in the comments. Anyway, uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.